Welcome to the Kidney Cancer Journal webinar focusing on new developments in renal cancer therapeutics. I'm Bob Figlin. I'm going to moderate this session with my colleagues Tom Hudson and Brian Reaney. Uh, I'm the Steven Spielberg Family Chair in Hematology Oncology at Cedar sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles. And many of you know uh, Brian and Tom. Brian is the Ingram Professor of, uh, of Medicine at Vanderbilt Ingram Cancer Center, directs the kidney cancer program, and is also the chief of their clinical trials efforts. And uh, Tom Hudson, well known to all of you as the director of the Urologic Oncology Program and co-chair of the Urologic Cancer Research and Treatment Center at Baylor University and professor of medicine at Texas A&M College. Tom and Brian, thank you and, and welcome to jo uh, joining us today. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Yep. So it's it's an interesting time. Right? The topic is is really going to be kidney cancer, and and we're going to focus on a novel drug, tavosidib, which on on March 10th was just approved by the Food and Drug Administration for advanced or refractory kidney cancer uh, after second line or more therapy. Uh, so this will be an important topic. So let's start, Brian, by just uh, talk a little bit about the molecule. And, and how you see that role in kind of targeting VEGF receptors. Yeah, so tivozinib, and as you know, we call it TiVo for short, um, it's been around a long time. It was developed as a very sort of clean and selective VEGF receptor inhibitor. So I think in the, in the family of tyrosine kinase inhibitors, you have the more selective ones like tivozinib and axitinib, and you have the, the multi-targeted, the serafinibs, cabozantinibs, lenvatinibs of the world. And, we could talk about the, the relative merits of each approach, but I think one of the one of the beauties of TiVo is its selectivity and potency against the VEGF target. And as you all know, that's integral to the biology of kidney cancer. It's fundamental to its very being, which is why these VEGF inhibitors have activity. So it was developed to be clean and selective, which I think probably is mostly reflected, and I know we'll talk about this later, in its tolerability profile. So those off-target toxicities you really don't see with TiVo. Uh, and you just tend to see the on-target ones like hypertension and whatnot. And and Tom, I always like having you on the call because of your PharmD background. Um, in terms of pharmacology and pharmacodynamics, how should a practicing medical oncologist think about TiVo when thinking about using this and delivering it in the in the clinical setting? Sure. So um, pharmacodynamically, um, I think Brian's kind of hit on it. So the, what what really striking about this molecule is that its pharmacodynamics is at nanomolar concentrations. It's inhibiting the VEGF receptors one, two, and three, which are the putative receptors known to be important in um, kidney cancer pathogenesis. And, and equally, it does not um, inhibit the um, um, off-target effects, um, off-target like CKID and some of the other off-targets that cause side effects. Um, from the pharmacokinetic standpoint, um, it has a long half-life. It's um, been measured a couple different ways, and I think it's come down to about a half-life of 99 hours um, for it. So it's um, that means it's going to stay in the system for a longer period of time. It's it's kind of uh, the best way to think of it, Bob, um, is that it's similar in its in its specificity to um, exidinib but different in its pharmacokinetic properties, completely opposite of what exidinib is with a short half-life. This has a longer half-life. And then putatively, Aveo, the company, believes that um, this may be advantageous. And certainly the dosing of it represents the PD and PK, very small milligram dosing. And it's given um, for three weeks on and one week off. And so the thought is that you have continual um, suppression of VEGF receptor um, because of its long half-life. So better, yeah, tolerability, better tolerability and then this, this um, suppression of VEGF receptor. Yeah, I, I think that's, that's really very insightful because I think we all, when we're treating patients, we think about not only the target, but we think about how we're going to deliver it. And depending upon the kind of toxicity profiles it develops, if we need to discontinue, hold, or modify, uh, we always think about the half-life of the molecule in terms of thinking about that. So Brian, take, take us through kind of its development, a little bit about TiVo1 and more recently 
TiVo3 clinical trial that ultimately now we know has led to the FDA approval. So help us understand the patient population, some of the results, and dive into the some of those outcomes that you think are important. Yeah, sure. So, you know, as we were discussing, it probably has one of the most interesting regulatory and development histories for a cancer molecule. I'm not sure the company would call it interesting, but it's been long. Um, this is probably going back 10 years, I'm guessing. I'm, I'm losing track of time, but, but many, many years. So I remember in some ASCOs a long time ago, they did an initial sort of phase two study. I believe it was even randomized discontinuation, if I'm rem remembering correctly. And it was pretty clear that it was active and very well tolerated. So there was an early signal that was developed. It came along a bit after, I would say, at least in the second or, or so wave of TKI development. So sunitinib, serafinib first. This was, this was definitely after that in the second or third wave. TiVo1 was a large phase three frontline study, so previously untreated, randomized to, to tavozinib versus serafinib, looking at progression-free survival. And it did meet its progression-free survival endpoint in that trial, and also a response rate advantage. And, and it was very active on the order of activity as, as other TKIs in the frontline setting. Um, so it was clearly very active. The problem with TiVo1 was that there was a one-way crossover. So when patients progressed on serafinib, they crossed over on study and got tavozinib, which we now know is a very active second-line agent or, or refractory agent, I should probably say. Whereas patients who were initially randomized to tavozinib did not cross over, they were left to get standard of care, which probably wouldn't be a problem today, but at the time, and especially in the countries where it was conducted, um, in parts of Eastern Europe and Russia, there really was no second-line therapy. So it became a trial of two drugs versus one, serafinib then TiVo versus just TiVo alone for many, many patients. Because of that, um, the survival hazard ratio was above one. It was well above one, um, which we now think and, and I believe really reflects that sort of two drug versus one drug phenomenon. But at the time, uh, the FDA wasn't so convinced. And, and certainly you can sort of understand their position that they don't want to approve a drug that might may adversely affect survival. So it went to a NODAC. It was not approved in the U.S. It ultimately, years later, was approved in Europe. So you can see how different regulators view data differently. And then TiVo3 was a response by the company to this problem, to this crossover problem to say, okay, let's study it again. Let's use the same comparator arm and let's not allow you know, any crossover. Let's not have this crossover problem uh, and make sure that you know, we're not adversely impacting survival. So that's why TiVo3 was a bit unique. It was done in a refractory setting simply because you can no longer do frontline TKI versus frontline TKI, as you well know. So the, the setting had to change to a more contemporary setting. Um, and it showed progression-free survival um, and response rate advantages in that setting. Some people have questioned the use of a serafinib control arm, and that was entirely in response to TiVo1 and making and really recapitulating that study again in a, in a different setting. Um, and uh, and then the survival hazard ratio, um, the last one is below one. I don't quite remember the number, but it was below one. And we've seen that in other TKI trials. Any Every trial that's looked at TKI versus TKI has, has shown about equivalent survivals. And that's just a reflection of all the active drugs we have that patients can get upon, upon uh, progression. So that's the, the very short version of a very long drug history. <laughs> yeah. So Tom, your, your thoughts about that data and also just add kind of they had some quality of life data associated with that. So you can, I mean, I think that we we really do expect that agents that have a, a more targeted effect against the VEGF receptors without uh, targeting other uh, 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 areas of the of the of the biology may have less off-target toxicity. Your thoughts about that, Tom? We can't hear you, Tom. Um, yes, so so as uh, Brian said, you know, we we saw this kind of uh, unique characteristics of this drug play out since its development from the phase two randomized discontinuation trial, which was published by Nosov et al. And we saw a very um, kind of on target uh, level of toxicity, the bulk of it being grade one or two, very minimal, I mean, very minimal grade four toxicity and things that were problematic with the generation of TKIs of the day, hand foot syndrome, for instance, fatigue, much less so with this agent, where we did see an increase in side effect, 
which we now recognize is because of its potent inhibition of VEGF with hypertension and dysphonia. So we see that. And then that's played out with um, the trial. So the phase um, three TIVO one trial, I was senior author on that publication. Bob Mozer was the first author. And as Brian mentioned, you know, we hope for um, approval of that drug, but, but because of that issue um, with the crossover design, it was not um, in, um, in TIVO 3, TIVO 3 really shed, um, allowed us to really reconfirm and shed light on the benefits of Tivozinib in regards to its tolerability. Now showing it in a refractory patient population, which you would expect may not respond as well and also may not tolerate the therapy as well, doing, doing very well. And so what we know from the side effects that we've, Brian and and I have presented from that trial is that it's, it seems to be very well tolerated. So patients who have had prior VEGF, pi, prior IO therapies, even prior exidinib therapy seem to have benefit efficacy as well as tolerability that seems to, there's no signal that it's, um, no signal there that there's any um, side effect that we need to be more concerned of than others. And the side effects look fairly uh, familiar to the TIVO1 study. And I just want to comment on a real world trial that was um, published. You know, there's a few of them out there since it was approved in 2017 in um, the EU. Um, our buddy, uh, Mike Staler from Germany pulled together over 20 some patients and had a real world data analysis in there from November uh, 2017 to October 2018 and treated patients both in the frontline setting as well as in the subsequent line setting, which in his small population included second line all the way to sixth line and was really able to show um, what we all what we had seen in the TIVO1 and TV, TIVO3. So in the frontline setting, he was getting a PFS of 14.9 months, real world, 30.3 months overall survival. And then the later line setting, we are seeing um, overall survivals um, of 8.6 months, um, excuse me, a PFS of 8.6 months or so in the later line setting, which was again, very similar to what we saw Brian reported. And then side effects that you mentioned about quality of life wise, it was very similar too with hypertension, diarrhea, fatigue, and hoarseness being the majority. And that is generally um, grade two in severity. So, so Brian, you know, this seems like an example of uh, the biology of kidney cancer and patients that survive kidney cancer post prior TKIs, that there's still a VEGF dependence of the tumor. And that when you come along and you give them a potent VEGF receptor TKI, even in later settings, that portion of their biology continues to benefit. So how, how, do you, how are you going to think about using this data in your day in and day out practice when you start to see these patients post multiple prior lines but still having some evidence of of uh of vegf dependence so so how, how do you conceptualize that yeah i think your your point is a good one i i don't think it's analogous to prostate cancer where it's still testosterone dependent through multiple lines of hormones kidney cancers vegf addicted through multiple lines of therapy and this was a third and fourth line study remember so these patients had seen at least one VEGF agent. Many patients had seen two or more, perhaps. Um, and so you're, you're absolutely right. The biology remains, at least in part, although not in whole, VEGF dependent. That's why we see activity here. You know, again, what's in, you know, there's sort of a debate of, do you want to get more or less selective um, in your TKI use as you go into refractory setting? And we could certainly argue serafinib is not necessarily a contemporary multi-targeted TKI like Cabo or Lenvatinib would be, but it's, it's, I think, even more impressive when you have this level of activity with a very selective agent because it's only inhibiting VEGF, right? It's not inhibiting anything else. So again, to your point, there is a, a level of fundamental VEGF dependency here. To answer your question, you know, I, as I move from an IO-containing regimen up front, and I use a lot of IO-TKI, to, to a refractory regimen, which for me is usually single-agent TKIs, my mindset has gone away from cure and more to control of disease because uh, I don't think... TKIs cure patients. I think IO-based therapy does. And so the side effect profile of an agent has always been very important to me in that refractory setting. That's why I've used a lot of axitinib in that setting before I was using axipembro. So, so I think the, huge, the major advantage for this drug is not just activity, because I think the activity is probably comparable to other TKIs, but that it's so well tolerated. And is, as you both know, in the third and fourth line setting, these patients get pretty beat up. 
you're starting to question, am I really helping this patient by giving them more therapy or am I hurting them more? I know that's something that I face when patients are getting to third and fourth line. So I'm pretty careful about choosing agents with what I perceive as, you know, the best tolerated profile, because at least I'm not harming the patient to look at it in those terms. And so I, I will use this agent very liberally in the third and fourth line, or, or even if they fail, say, an IOTKI regimen, I think it's perfectly appropriate there. And Tom, your thoughts as an experienced investigator in this space? Yeah, I mean, just to second what Brian said, and maybe a little bit more granular on on the actual resumes we would choose. So I think right now, if we look at market data, the um, in the community setting, there is uptake of IOTKI, and it's gen generally an exidinib-based regimen, say exidinib Pembro. Um, and then what we're seeing um, doctors prescribe as second and third line, generally we're moving into the TKI space and you have drugs like cabozantinib, Lenev. Um, but really when we start moving into after cabozantinib, so now into the third line space, we know Lenvatinib Everlime is a very active regimen, but it doesn't have a, necessarily a very large uptake yet among community doctors. So they're looking for a therapy, as Brian uh, communicated, that is one that can can accomplish the goal of, of, of stabilizing disease, disease control, which is very, you know, we don't talk a lot about disease control because we're looking so much at, at shrinkage of tumor, but the disease control rate with tivosinib is actually very, very impressive, if I recall, um, and then a tolerability profile. So I think it makes it an ideal drug to choose um, in that setting of a third line um, after a cabozantinib or a fourth line. So, um, Again, what we showed in TiVo3 was that you could have exposure to exidinib as you would have in your first line combo with an IOTKI and then get later uh, tivozinib and still have this level of activity. And, and Bob, we really don't have a lot of therapies where we have, have that kind of data, phase three data to show benefit at that line. Now, um, we know things are gonna change. We know um, what dictates what you choose. Second, third, and fourth line is, is in some regards what you got first in regards to what the TKI is. So if you get Cabo Nevo, that's gonna change what you're gonna get second. You're no longer gonna get Cabo second. Then we have to start thinking what's the options then? Is it could it be a Tavozinib? Could it be an Exidinib or a Lenvatinib Everolimus? So I think the, the data we saw in TiVo3 certainly makes that drug an option for use in that setting. Yeah, and, and we, know, we know, for example, that there's clearly a dose response effect to TKIs targeting VEGF and, and clear cell RCC. And I'm just wondering out loud to the, to the two of you, whether the real benefits of tavosinib are in part explained by its nanomol or IC50s. And, and the fact that you can get such inhibition at, real, at concentrations that are really quite low. Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, you know, I'm a, I'm a big believer in, in optimal dosing of TKIs. I spent a lot of sleepless nights thinking about it. Um, and so I think you're right. I think the fact that you can achieve that, um, and it's really fairly simple dosing, you know, and I think but that's appealing too, you know, sort of in a, in a clinical community practice. So, so I think you're right. I think there's good pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics. You have the half-life issue, which could be good and could be bad, and we can sort of debate that. But, but obviously it is what it is. Um, and I think, I think the long half-life doesn't hurt this compound because it's so darn tolerable. You know, I think some other multi-targeted agents, which are, are much more toxic in my opinion, patients will suffer if it takes a long time to get out of their system. And I just don't think you see that to any large extent with TiVo. So you don't think that there's any challenge in navigating the hypertension associated with the, with the TiVo because of the long half-life in, in terms of controlling it once a person develops it? I don't, I think in the early days, we were all refreshing our memories about antihypertensives, <laughs> but now it's been 10 plus years, gosh, 15 years to make us all feel old, 15 or 20 years we've been working with VEGF TKIs. So I feel, I and my staff feel pretty comfortable managing hypertension and there's, I, I can't think of a patient where I've stopped a drug, like permanently stopped for hypertension. You know, so I think it's, I think most people feel comfortable enough. So I, I don't think that's gonna be a huge issue. And for you, Tom, the same? Absolutely the same. One thing about, you know, there's no pure, pure uh, VEGF um, inhibitor. So what we see with, Tivo, with TiVo is that it is nanomolar at VEGF, but the next off target is so much higher, you're just never going to get there. Yeah, <laughs> I right. mean, you would have to take a bottle at one time of the drug to hit the other. So I think that's what makes it so advantageous. So, so just, you know, thinking out loud, I, I mean, I, so we have an FDA approval. 
We have TiVo3 that shows that continuing to target the receptor uh, seems to be helpful, a toxicity profile that is that is manageable because we've all been down that path. Uh, do you think it's an easily combinable drug for the future? I mean, is it something that, Tom, we should be thinking about in clinical trial designs to, to bring back the role, not even bring back, but kind of a next generation IOTKI with a nanomolar IC50 TKI? Thoughts about that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think so. We're looking for um, uh, combinable therapies to add on the backbone of a VEGF inhibitor because we know just from the pathogenesis of clear cell that that's going to be an important target for us to continue to suppress. And, and having a drug that has that predictable side effect is going to make it advantageous when we combine two. And I think that's one of the advantages we've seen already in the marketplace with Axipembro that it's gotten such great uptake is because people feel the drug's well tolerated and they know the drug. And I think they're going to be equally pleased when Tavosinib uh, Nivolumab, the TiVo Nevo study, um, you know, continues to enroll. And hopefully that's a positive trial and, and patients and investigators are able to utilize that drug. So I think absolutely. And one of the things, you know, we're not really meant to necessarily go and talk about on this conversation this today is, is just we haven't really decided as a field, are we done with just doublets? You know, um, if you start thinking that there's a need for a triplet regimen, some of our colleagues that are, are, are more immunology focused want to add in ipilimumab into this uh, mix, then that may be something crucial too, as far as for the tolerability. So look, you guys have been spectacular as I knew you would be. So why don't Brian and then Tom, why don't you uh, speak to the community physician, seeing the occasional clear cell RCC patient and kind of summarize for them how they should be thinking about tavosinib integrating it into their practice. Brian, you go first. Yeah, I would say I would think about it as a, you know, very clean, well-tolerated, you know, VEGF TKI, and I would integrate it, frankly, sort of early and often in the refractory patient, which is where the data supports. Um, to Tom's point about other combos and triplets, absolutely, we'll investigate that. But, you know, as of, as of today, right now, I would think about it and reach for it, you know, in that refractory patient. I think you'll be pleasantly surprised at the tolerability, you and the patient especially after being maybe beat up with a frontline doublet, you know, or a second line Cabo or something, I think you'll be pleasantly surprised, not just at the efficacy, which I think is, is, um, you know, impressive, but moreover that tolerability, that's the calling card of this agent. And I think, and I think you, you and your staff are going to like that very much. <laughs> and before I turn to Tom for the same question, any special population data that we're aware of, what happens in a brain med patient and a bone med patient? Is there any any information from the TiVo3 trial that helps us figure out exactly what kind of refractory patient might benefit? Not, the short answer is no. I don't think brain mets were allowed in, even if controlled, Tom can correct me. I don't think we've looked at organ subsets yet. And you know, those analyses are always a bit flawed. Yeah. So I don't, I don't think there's one more than the other. Um, I'm interested to see what Tom says, but I, I'm not aware of any data that would support a subpopulation that's particularly enriched or not enriched. And Tom, speaking to the community practice, what would be your take-home lessons? Sure. First off, I agree with what Brian just mentioned that we don't have that yet with this agent, so we'll see how that unfolds. For the community oncologist, I would I would also echo what Brian said. This should be one of the agents that you put in the box of therapies you're going to choose from to give your patients. We now have the, I guess the the advantage or disadvantages of having multiple lines of therapy to choose from, knowing that patients never make it past the third or fourth line for most people. So you're gonna want to select agents to choose from that are gonna be your most active, the ones that are gonna do the heavy lifting that patients tolerate well and really accomplish the goals that you and the patient have set up, which is generally quality of life preservation and longevity. And so Tavosinib is gonna be pushed over into that box then of therapies and should be considered a therapy in the first few lines of, of treatment. And we know, as you know, Bob, that we've shown, unfortunately, many patients don't make it past the fourth line of therapy. And so we need to have it up there and people need to realize this is this is a therapy they're gonna wanna have on their, on their list of therapies to choose from. Well, Brian and Tom, you've been spectacular as I expected you would be. Uh, I hope that you're safe in your home and in your practice. And this is a great summary of a of, a, of another novel agent that's going to have a role in our patients. So 
thank you and uh, best regards to your families. Yeah, thanks, yeah. Bob, it was fun. Take care, guys. See ya. Take care. Keep it around.